So we'll start with about two minutes of chanting the Odaimoku Namu Myoho Denge Kyo, and it will be slow enough uh, and moderate enough pace that you could follow it pretty easily. Realize the mastery of my feelings and emotions of self-doubt, insecurity, and fear. I know there is one rhythm, one dance, one song of the Dharma spirit of life and of love which is joyfully blissfully and abundantly creative and courageous freely expressive and always in the moment always ecstatic always secure in knowing the complete oneness with the music of the dharma radiantly expressive in every sound in every vision, every taste, every scent, every touch, every single feeling and emotion, always fertile and ripe with expectant and loving abundance, and in each and every dance of spirit, in each and every song of the Dharma made. As I live in the radiant and joyful light, dance and song of the Dharma, of spirit, life, and love, I know that I am one with the music of the Dharma, completely immersed and at one with the flow of the Dharma, of spirit, life, and love, dancing with and to the infinite rhythm and fullness of the wondrous universal creative song filled with absolute knowing, absolute security and courage. I live in the eternal rhythm and richness of this wondrous universal song, dancing with joy in every opportunity to risk everything for love, for dreams, for life and for every challenge met in this marvelous human adventure. 
openly embracing, accepting, and welcoming with eternal enthusiasm each experience of living awake, aware, and alive as the glorious light of the Dharma flows through my veins. This song of the Dharma is present in the music of my days and my nights. My life, my feelings and emotions are in perfect harmony with the rhythmical dance of infinite hope, alive with pregnant expectation, with the infinite confidence of knowing and living each and every experience as an expression of all the good, bountiful abundance of the infinitely creative, vibrant, loving, joyful, reproductive Dharma song. And in this richness of this loving song, there is perfect health, complete wholeness, and fulfillment. I am so grateful for the symphony of music and dance in the Dharma, in spirit, in life, in love, for the absolute harmony in every song that is expressed in me by me as a receptive instrument, as a manifestation of the Dharma, of spirit, life, and love. And for all the love, life, and joy in each and every new moment of manifesting, of realizing the Dharma saw, I am so grateful for the symphony. So very grateful. As I release these words into the infinite rhythm of the universe, into the wonderful music and harmony of the Dharma, as it swells with joyful acknowledgement and acceptance of a song in perfect harmony, and so it is. Ashe. So I invite you to take three deep breaths in and out at your own pace. As we come back in together. So I want to bring uh, your attention to a parable this evening. Unless you'd like to talk about your experience with that short meditation. I'll tell you the only other places that I've used it was in a, a um, Menninger Clinic at the Menninger Clinic. And um, also for my groups behind bars my incarcerated folks. Um, so I'd I like to play a little bit with those things. Because a lot of times it's necessary to remind ourselves that we do entirely have the power to change our minds and to change the focus. Um, and just change the way we think about things. 
So it's a continuing exploration. So as you may recall, uh, I come from a school that is based on the Lotus Sutra. And so the stories and uh, texts that we use are all Lotus Sutra based. And this is one of the most famous parables. Um, there's a total of seven of them in the Lotus Sutra. And this is the parable of the magic city. So once upon a time, of course, on a long, dangerous road, um, which was so bad that there was only one man who lived near it. And many people wished to pass this road, on this road, to find a place of treasures. So they were led by someone who was very clever, wise, and informed, completely informed by the conditions of the dangerous road. And halfway through their journey, they got tired of walking and said to the leader, we're tired. We are also afraid of the danger that's on this road and we cannot go a step further. Our destination is still a long ways off. So we wish to go back. And the leader who was very skillful thought, what a pity. They wish to go back without getting great treasures. So he made a magic city, a city appear by magic in the distance. And he said to his followers, don't go back. You can stay in that city up ahead, do anything you like. And if you enter the city, you will be peaceful. And if you go on afterwards, you will reach the place of treasures and then you can go home. So the worn out folks were very happy and had great joy. And they said, we've never had such joy like this before. And we will be able to get off this bad road and become peaceful. And so they entered the magic city and felt peaceful. And once he saw that they were rested and relieved from their fatigue, he made the city disappear and said, now the place of treasures is near. Let us go further to get the treasures. I made this city by magic in order to enable you to rest. And so there's a quote that goes along with this that, you know, the road to the capital takes 14 days. And if you walk for 13 and stop on that date, how can you uh, view the moon over the capital. So the Buddha is like the leader of the treasure hunt. And he knows the bad road that is consisting, that consists of birth, death, and illusion. And those who are satisfied uh, with the magic city are thought to be Shravakas and Prachaka Buddhas. And although they may think they have reached enlightenment, they have not reached it yet. It is similar to their satisfaction with the magic city. There are many uh, places in the Lotus Sutra where the self-satisfied individuals get up and leave when the Buddha is ready to preach, thinking they had already achieved a level of awakening. So sometimes, we have to be reminded that real enlightenment is further away and can be obtained by practicing the way of the bodhisattva. But even that is not sufficient, that ultimately it's following the Buddha path that will lead us all to awakening. And the bodhisattva path, just like the path of the Shravaka and Prachaka Buddha, are but three of the ways one can approach the Buddha path. They're all pretty much the same, essentially, according to this story. It just depends on the capacity of those who are following, those who are traveling. But sometimes we need different kinds of expedients. Um, 
in our tradition, we have uh, particular blessings that are often given, or people like to have amulets of protection, you know, those kinds of rituals. But ultimately, there is only one path, and that is the Buddha vehicle, the Buddha path. So it's also a reminder that we have to persist, that just when we think that we have reached the end of our limit, that we've done everything that we could, and we're just too tired, we're worn out, much like some of us may be feeling right now today, because it seems like such a long haul with the work that we're all trying to do and trying to come to a place where it doesn't seem like we're going backwards. That we have to be reminded that the treasure is still ahead. And sometimes it is very dark before we get there, but only because of our persistence and our perseverance do we manage to get to the treasure. Many have fallen into defeat, thinking that no matter how much we struggle, we're not getting anywhere. And, and some of us may drop out and just live a life that must be more easy and pleasurable um, and just escape into an easy attitude towards life. And then there's one who falls into evil ways as he, we try to find a shortcut. And those are the two extremes, but always there is the middle way, the path between the two. That constant progress is the natural course of our living beings. And it is the right and true way for us to live. And sometimes we forget uh, that we are living lives that are filled with suffering. But one of the famous quotes of our founder is, uh, he says, suffer what there is to suffer, enjoy what there is to enjoy, regard both suffering and joy as facts of life and continue to chant no matter what happens. Then you will experience boundless joy from the law. And it's these kinds of reminders that we often need to help us become more creative in our approach to our practice of the Dharma. You know, sometimes we could just dance the Dharma, you know, uh, and just have fun with it. Because I think sometimes we're too serious. And I love to see um, practitioners laugh, you know, and have joy in dancing and greeting each other. But a lot of times we forget about those things and we forget that it's also okay for us to cry and sometimes commiserate with each other because we are having a difficult time. And it reminds us of the great expedient that we all have that is so necessary to our growth and development as practitioners. And that is the Sangha that we have to rely on each other in addition to the teachings and the Buddha himself. Many times I could say that um, I look at the Buddha and the three virtues of the Buddha are recognition of the parent, teacher, or sovereign. I spend a lot of time with the Buddha that is my parent because I tend to impose my father on that picture of the Buddha in full recognition that while he was an imperfect man, he taught me many, many great lessons. And so it is a face that I can look at and be safe and comfortable and feel a tremendous amount of love in my times of need. And I think that there's a reason that we are taught that we are children of the Buddha. Many of us forget that, that we don't have to be the grown-ups all the time. 
we do have a parent available to us, as well as the teacher and the sovereign. I don't go to the sovereign that often because I'm too stubborn. Um, but sometimes I need to go there. And I always go to the teacher um, because the, no matter how many times you read the teachings of the Buddha, there's always something in it to bring you back. And I think that as practitioners, we are having to be some of the most creative individuals that we can be. And that's why we're all so different. And that's why even as our path is the same, we have different ways of doing it. And I've mentioned before that all of us are necessary. All of us blossom differently. And that's so we can reach as many people as possible. Because not everybody is going to want to, you know, talk to an older woman or someone that lives in Texas. <laughs> you know, I must be tainted by living in Texas. And, or, you know, we all have to have an appeal for people to come to the Dharma. They have to see the embodiment of the Dharma in us so that they're able to recognize a space for them to be safe, a space for them to be welcomed home. And I think that's the most critical thing that we have to do, that we have to embody, as it were, a place that is like the magic city where people can find rest and uh, help and not be fatigued so that they can continue to pursue the path of the Dharma and reach their own awakening. It's an awesome task that we have. And sometimes I think it seems overwhelming because we're such an individualistic society. And we have to get out of that and come to the point of understanding our deep, deep connection to each other. And once we're able to do that and persist in our efforts to develop trust, to develop connection, and to just be there for each other, no matter what. It's some of the most difficult work I think we have to do. I'm involved in a faith leaders group and we have a tendency to address a lot of social justice issues. But the one that came up recently was about um, the Palestinians and the Jews. And it caused a great deal of turmoil because our leader is a rabbi. And so working through having him explain the dangers of walking into that discussion, um, and then another person who was persisting in pushing the discussion uh, revealed cracks in our group. So we are working and really taking the time to be honest and straightforward with each other. But it's difficult. And we all thought we were friends. <laughs> but the difficulty of this particular topic revealed that, you know, some people are adamant about being right and having their own way. And so how do we as practitioners deal with people like that? That's the question. That we can't be swayed by the difficulty because it's in our power to be able to overcome it. Even as we may take a break and sit with it and chant about it or pray about it, to find a creative way of dealing with that particular person or that particular issue in a way that benefits all. And so often we're just not used to thinking that way. And I think with what's going on now, I don't know how it is where you are, 
but our um, so-called governor signed into law permitless concealed weapons. And we've already seen the harm in just a few days as people have increased the sales of guns. And I, I don't want to say that he's a stupid man because there's purpose behind his action that I just can't personally understand. But I also know that all of us are going to have to work together to find a way to reach his heart, as well as the rest of the people that work with him. And you know, we've been here before, all of us. And our history in this country is full of issues like this. But we as Buddhists, perhaps we can find a different path, a different way of touching a heart, of moving a mind, of holding up life as so very precious. And that means all of us, even as we are paying attention to the sick children, just as the Buddha says, any parent focuses on the sickest child. When we have a lot of sick children, So it's our creativity, our talent, our ability to access our own skillful means, while at the same time, we take the time to stop for a rest in our magic city, to overcome our fatigue and continue the path, continue the journey till we reach the treasure of awakening. And I think we do that in many respects every day, even though they're small, like peeling an onion. We awaken to new things, new ideas every day. And somehow, I have the hope that we'll figure out how to overcome this one too. But it will be a uniquely Buddhist way of doing it. And maybe, just maybe, we'll take the lead. What do you think? You brought up uh, one of my favorite memories of when I was in Japan, our head temple is on the, uh, a very steep mountain. But every morning at about four o'clock, something happens. I'm not quite sure what happens, something changes. And I remember uh, it was like a voice in my head calling my name that I had to wake up. And I'm thinking, why in the heck would I get up at four o'clock? I have another hour before I have to really get up. But something woke me. And there was that stillness. And then all of a sudden the birds and they started really talking to each other and having this wonderful chorus. And I looked out the window and there was this fog drifting up off the mountains, such a beautiful sight and the sounds. And then uh, the longer I was there, I eventually heard the, uh, the people who were in the monastery to become uh, ordained as they started chanting in the dark on their way up the mountain to the head temple. It was such a beautiful moment and made me realize how lucky I was or how fortunate I was to find this path so that I could uh, experience things like that. Thank you. We have, and I, maybe it's part of the Western culture that we grow up in that we're not supposed to center ourselves. And we're not supposed to be able to speak from our own needs, right? And so sometimes 
I know I used to feel a bit of guilt about that. Um, but we have an expression in our tradition that says practice for yourself and practice for others. And that practice for yourself is practice for others. Because if you're not practicing for Stacy, and Stacy's in an awful mood, imagine the world that Stacy influences. You know, and I think about that a great deal uh, because I can always tell sometimes after I, I visit my incarcerated folks, because I know how much they feed my spirit. And I feel really good. I miss visiting them uh, because I gain so much more just from being with them. And then when I go out, I'm in such a, a better mood, even as I have to drive an hour and a half to get there, you know. Um, but I understood finally that if I did not practice for myself, I couldn't help anybody. You know, like that story on the airplane, put your own mask on first. And so it's important to practice for Stacy. It really is. And then you can practice for others just because you've practiced for you. And how you practice for yourself has such an incredible impact on how you embody what you practice. So please practice for yourself as much as possible, you know. Um, that's our, it's what we have to do. Because people who are seeking what we have can't see it if we're not embodying it. And we cannot embody it if we're not taking care of ourselves. Because I think of the witch that comes out when I'm not taking care of myself. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be around me, you know. If someone says, oh, what do you practice? Oh, nothing, <laughs> you know. I feel like saying that I don't practice. Guess what? Because I'm such a witch today. <laughs> yeah. Practice for self is practice for others. We should never forget that. And I would highly recommend, um, oh. it's the, the Center for Courage Renewal.org. It's CourageRenewal.org. And there are guidelines from Thank you. Uh, Parker Palmer, oh, yeah. I'm familiar. The Circle of Trust. And the one that I really, really love is the understanding that everybody has their own inner teacher. Mm. And we're not here to, you know, teach each other in that respect that and we're not here to change minds or convince people otherwise but just to be present for each other a hundred percent no matter what you know um and and there's having experienced the um circle of trust was such a powerful powerful experience for me um and i was in a group that was 100% white, except for me. <laughs> and um, one of my friends said, uh, was saying to me as we walked in, she said, I hope this isn't, you're not the only one here. You know, and there were people who were deep Southerners. And I thought, okay, I can deal with this. And these were the most loving people that I had encountered in a long time, all because of those, that circle of trust. Um, and I found myself sharing so many things with even 80-year-old uh, men from Alabama, you know, which was kind of a wild experience at that time. So I know it can be done if people are willing to adhere to agreements of how to treat each other. 
Uh, and it's important that we all think about those things. You know, as Buddhists, I think a lot of times we forget that we're all different and assume that all Buddhists think the same way. We don't, mm. you know. Yeah. And in the same way, when we're dealing with people of other faith traditions, we don't think alike. But it's important. Uh, and that's one of the things we're battling with right now is coming to terms with the agreements or lack thereof on how to treat each other and how to come to this in a way that honors the truth of our traditions. And so the exploration, I think, for each of us is to stand in our truth while we find out what that truth is. Our, my early adventures in interfaith and intrafaith really taught me uh, so many lessons about that because there were so many assumptions. You know, we were invited to participate in different services and ended up having Christians telling us what we were supposed to do as Buddhists. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do what my faith tells me to do. And your understanding of my faith is not mine. But being able to do that peacefully and calmly turned situations around. Because the expectation of any tradition is that you stand in that truth, whatever it is. And no one has a right to uh, keep you from it. Sometimes I think I give the impression that I don't like Christians, uh, that I get tired of being treated like bless my pointed little head, you know, that I'm this poor soul that lost her way when I should be practicing Christianity. And they're always trying to change me. So, you know, it's like, okay. But the power of our faith and the power of our truth is strong enough. So create turmoil, rebel, bring them along to a better place of interaction. They may not see it right now, um, but it does get you to a place where absolute trust becomes the core, that you can trust the Muslim person or the Christian or the Jew or even the Hindi person, that we're all going to respect each other. We're all going to look for spaces that our truths interact and they will because they're all based on the same thing, right? All of us are seeking an awakening, enlightenment of some form or fashion. All of us seek to love and compassion. And once we get to that place, then we've mastered um, not being in harmony. So use the power of your faith and practice to give you strength to uphold the convictions of your faith. Number one is chanting first once I recognized that there were going to be some difficulties, you know, standing by myself in my truth. Um, but to be that like a mountain, immovable mountain, yes, but <laughs> you know, kind of thing um, is, and to do it with kindness and honoring the other person's truth and to respect that. It's, you know, it doesn't always work out. I mean, uh, there is another group I was with for many years and I realized that I was the only one having the problem. Everybody else was satisfied. And for my personal well-being, it was better for me to leave and find a new, uh, new way to be. And that opened up even more doors. You know, what I think, was it Patricia? 
um, has invested a lot of time in her group. And um, in my case, the group was, a, you know, another faith group of the same tradition that I was in at the time. And when I started having difficulties with how they were practicing and how they were um, exercising and embodying the truth, that as they saw it, I recognized that I didn't believe the way they believed. And so rather than trying to change it, I had to find a new way to go. And that was very painful, but it also opened up uh, my life to a very deeper, more joyful way of practicing. Um, after I got over all the negativity, <laughs> because I recognized that um, what had happened for me was that their approach to me was so negative that I took that on. And my thinking became more self-harming than self-fulfilling. Uh, and so I had to, for my own sake, get out of the way of that group. So you have to assess it carefully and see if it's going to cost you too much of yourself. These are just everything I think that we experience is like the Buddha battling the armies of Mara. You know, and saying, no, it can't be done. It can't be done. And we're saying, yes, it can. Yes, it can. And we'll get there. It's, we can say for all of us, nevertheless, what is it? We persisted. We all persisted. And that's a good thing. That's my goal is to be real and always have hope no matter what even in the worst of times. I hear sometimes from some folks that I'm too Pollyanna-ish, so, but I'd rather be Pollyanna. Because it's not so much about the practice because life is our practice. And how we engage life ethically, morally, with integrity and the truth that we're grounded in is important. Yeah. You gotta do it. We are creatives. People who practice faith deeply are creative. And however we pull it all together, you know, uh, it, it's magical. And art in whatever form communicates so well what we're all doing, right? At least I think so. And I've, I've noticed a lot of different uh, groups and people who work in trying to deal with trauma and you know, just our ability to continue in the face of all of the questions we might have about how to live our very best lives, that music is a part of it. And it's like, okay, yeah, we can use music. We can use whatever it takes to open our hearts, open that space within us that responds. And I can't think of a single person who doesn't respond to music, right? No matter what. So we keep going. Yeah.